Let me share my screen. This is where I want. Yeah. Just checking if there's anyway. Okay. Okay. So um, today I'm going to be talking about this paper here, which is called Model Agnostic Meta Learning for Vast Adaptation of Deep Networks. Uh, it's the first author is Chelsea Finn, who's actually now, at the time she was a PhD student at Berkeley, but um, what's pretty crazy and amazing, she was like in her research career, she was very successful in the sense of, uh, of, of um, publishing a lot of papers that had a big impact. And so she actually went straight from finishing her PhD at Berkeley to becoming a professor at Stanford. And so now she's a professor at Stanford. Um, and uh, one of the main things that she specializes in, or she like, for example, the things she teaches courses in is meta learning. And I think this is one of her like main papers or main contributions to the, um, to the field. And so that's why I chose it as a paper because I think it's um, a relatively important paper in meta learning that, is, uh, that forms a basis for a lot of other papers, either out of her lab or that have been cited. I, I don't remember how many times this paper has been cited. Um, if you were here last week, or if you got to hear the paper last week, what's interesting is that the problem being solved in this paper or addressed in this paper is very similar to the paper that we did last week, even though that paper is, um, how many, it's like 21 years, published 21 years before this one. But anyway, let's uh, jump straight into it. Um, and I, I would say that one of the reasons why one of the main differences is that this paper focuses on a slightly a more specific problem than the previous one. Um, but yeah, let's let's jump straight into it. And I'm just gonna every so often check the chat and Q and A to make sure that I'm addressing any questions. So um, the the in the abstract they they point out uh, it's uh, the goal of and I'd like to start out the goal of meta learning is to train a model on a variety of learning tasks such that it can solve a new learning task using you know, only a small number of training samples. So this is uh, essentially the, the meta, meta learning problem, which is you have data from a lot of other tasks and you want to train pre-train a model on that, that data. And then with relatively small amount of data on a new task, be able to fine tune that model to perform well on that task. Um, and then they, they point out from the beginning what their, um, what their contribution is. As they say, the parameters of the, in our approach, the parameters of the model are explicitly trained such that a small number of gradient steps with a small amount of training data from a new task will produce good generalization performance on that task. So they are actually focusing on an even smaller problem in meta-learning, uh, which uh, I wanted to make clear from the beginning, which is, they're focusing on models that are trained using gradient descent. And so the meta-learning problem is when you have a small amount of data for a new task, but they're focusing on when you have a small amount of data for a new task and you want to perform a few, a small number of gradient updates on your model uh, to get it to perform well on that task. So it's a smaller problem than the overall meta-learning problem. Um, but they, uh, they, the, the contribution of the method is that this, well, one of the contributions is that this method works um, in a, for a large variety of different like general tasks from classification to regression to reinforcement learning. And um, that the only, the only uh, constraint is that you have to be using a model that can be trained using gradient descent. Um, yeah. Uh, and they, in the abstract, they just talk about some of their, their work, which, that the, their results, which we'll go over later. Um, moving on to the introduction. Uh, so they, they, in the introduction, they point out some of the classic uh, failure modes of meta-learning problems, which is that um, you want to leverage information from these other, for, like which they call prior experience or prior information, which is the, the data sets from other tasks and uh, use that to get a model and then you fine tune on this uh, small training set that you have for the new task, but you want to avoid overfitting. So uh, one of the issues 
with uh, previous methods or with this in general is that you can overfit because you have such a small training set. So your model could easily memorize that training set. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, they point out that the, this is for models that are trained using gradient descent over here. Um, yeah. Let's see, is there anything? Okay. Uh, and so they, they, they say that their method is different than previous methods because um, they don't add parameters when they're learning the new task and they don't put place constraints on the model architecture, just like citing some previous work. And um, so they, th their, their general approach to this problem is that they want to learn uh, an internal representation that broad is broadly suitable for many tasks. So they want to learn a generalizable internal representation. Um, and uh, they like the they point out that the classic way that they have done this in the past is that which you probably all know from like uh, transfer learning is you train a really large model on uh, like related but not the correct data like for example on image net for computer vision problems and then you have a small amount of data for your task so what you do is you take the you freeze all the weights except for the last layer the last couple of layers and you train it on that data and so um, you can consider the model up to the, the layers that all the frozen layers, like maybe say the top for the first 10 layers of the model as an encoder. And the output of that is your internal representation. And you're hoping that that representation is generalizable to a lot of tasks. So um, that's one way of doing it. But uh, they, they, their method is different because what they're doing is that they are actually they update all the parameters of the model when they're training on a new task and um, they are uh, hoping that the so the, the i guess the, the representation is almost the weights of the model um, let's see what they say here allowing for that okay yeah i'm not gonna go over that oh and then uh, a, a key a key idea of their method which they men mentioned many times is that so because they're optimizing all the, the, the like when, when, they, when they train on the new task in their meta-learning setting, they're up, updating all the parameters of the task. And um, consequently, and that what they're doing is they wanna perform few updates, like one gradient update. And consequently, what they're hoping is that with one gradient update, you'll see a large change in their performance and a large beneficial change in the performance of your model in the new task. And so that's why they say over here that our learning process can be viewed as maximizing the sensitivity of the loss function of new tasks with respect to the parameters. So essentially they're trying to find like a point in the parameter space of the model that it's, it, you can easily make large improvements in a task in many different tasks from. And so that's why it's sensitive because you'll see large improvements from a few gradient updates. Um, yeah. And okay, they they um yeah, they they in the rest of the introduction they just kind of talk about their uh their experimental results which we'll go over later. Um yeah. And I guess uh one thing they point out later but they kind of say here which we can introduce as another fundamental idea is that uh the the, this method is essentially learning uh, a generalizable initialization of the model for uh, the test task, for test tasks, because you're, you're just, you're giving a model that you're going to update all the parameters of. So like you can think of the parameters as the, of the, from meta, from the, the parameters that are learned from meta learning as like the initialization that will be used for the new task. Um, yeah, and so in section two, they go over the um, the meta learning problem, and uh, they say like uh, the meta learning problem treats entire tasks as training examples, and um, consequently, uh, for example, for meta learning, you need to be you need to have samples of multiple different tasks from a specific task space, um, and one thing that I thought was kind of Cool. I'm just going to check if there's any questions. Sorry. Okay. 
uh, one thing that I thought was kind of cool is that they try to create a generalizable uh, formalization of a task. So for them, a task contains a loss function, uh, distribution over initial observa observations, and a transition distribution, which I'll just highlight here, you can see, and an episode length. The truth is that like um, half of the things in this formalization are uh, required because they want to apply meta-learning to reinforcement learning. But um, it's true that you can think of like supervised learning as a, a simpler version of this uh, formalization where h equals one and uh, you really don't have, like in, for h, when h equals one, you don't have a transition function because you never, your inputs never change. Um, so anyway, uh, I like that they create this formalization and I think it's an interesting idea. Uh, and then um, in, the, in, the, in their problem formulation, they talk about, uh, again, like sampling from a task space, which is what P of, of T is. And um, excuse me. <coughs> they say that the, um, the, one of the key ideas is that the models in, of, the, of their method is that the model is improved by considering, I'll just read it up. Models improve by considering how the test error on new data from QI changes with respect to the parameters. Um, and so it says, in effect, the test error on sample tasks, TI, serves as a training error of the meta-learning process. So uh, it's, it's um, I'm hoping that through going through the learning algor algorithm, it will become clear how this method works, but they're kind of hinting at it here, which is that um, they, they, for each task, they're gonna have like a small amount of data, which will separate into a training and a test set. And then they will, train the model for a certain number of gradient steps in, in, the, in the explanation of it, they say one, and then they'll test it on the test set and they'll take a gradient, they'll perform a gradient uh, descent on the model um, based on the test set. Um, and we'll go over that again. I just wanted to introduce it once. Um, one question, does it sort of, so, uh mean that the, the, the losses have to be on the same scale, right? So imagine I have two tasks and <clears throat> one task, I just put a, a large multiplier on the loss, mm -hmm. like a factor of, of uh, 100,000. It's still the same loss, but it's, it's suddenly, I, I, I have a very different beast altogether. That's, that's a, a very good point. And actually one that isn't addressed in this method like uh, what you'll see here is that they just sum the losses from the different loss functions of the different tasks. Um, and consequently, if you have one loss that which dominates all the others or the gradient dominates all the others, then um, you're, uh, yeah. that you'll learn how to perform well on that task and not other tasks. So, it might be worthwhile to, to have like a, like a relative loss uh, have the gradient relativized by the by the size of the original loss on the untrained model or so yeah cool. it cool. relates actually to a question i wanted to ask everyone later which is whether the um experiments the, the task space of the ex each of the experiments was too small because uh we'll see that the experiments the task space is actually really small that they're, they 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 look at um for each one but anyway so I think the best way to understand the, the method or the algorithm is to just go through how it works. Um, so I'm gonna just go through algorithm one and explain each step. And then uh, hope maybe if anyone has any questions afterwards, let me know. So you need a distribution over tasks. So you need to be able to sit, for this method, you need to be able to sample over tasks. Um, uh, like the task space. But another way you could do that is you could just say like, I have 20 tasks, I consider them all samples um, from the task space. And then you just can only use that data. You can't collect more data. Um, and then the other thing is you have two learning rates, alpha and beta, which um, you have to set beforehand. Or you, uh, they, they say in the method that you can learn um, you can, you can learn, I think, alpha or either alpha or beta. Let's see. 
Oh, it says the step size alpha may be fixed as a hyperparameter or meta learn. So you can learn alpha as part of your method, thinking of it as um, uh, like as one of the parameters of your model. Um, and so what you do is so, so you you randomly initialize your network with parameters theta. You sample a batch of tasks, so you sample like ten tasks, and then for each task, you perform you you. Um, what you do is you uh, you uh, sorry you evaluate your model on all of the points in your training set or a batch of points in your training set on the loss function and then you perform one gradient update on your loss to get a new set of parameters theta prime then what you do is you uh, take the test set of that task and you evaluate your new model with parameters theta prime on the test set with the loss function. Um, and then what you do is you calculate the gradient of this loss in order to update your original parameters theta. So you, they say they show it over here. Um, and what you'll notice is that uh, you have to perform a gradient step with it for each task, and then you evaluate uh, your method on the new um, model. And what that means is that you actually have to take a gradient of a gradient. So uh, one of the issues, computational issues with this method is that you have to compute com the Hessian, which is like the second, uh, the second derivative of the, um, of like, of a function or like the, like the, the, the gradient, you have to perform a gradient operation twice. And that's actually very expensive. Um, so uh, that's one of the issues with this method. But yeah, essentially, um, that's how it works. You, for each task, you evaluate on your training set, perform one gradient update with respect to your loss, evaluate on your test set, and then perform one gradient update uh, uh, for each, like, by summing the losses of each task on each of their test sets with their new models in order to figure out how to change the parameters of theta. Um, I hope that wasn't too poorly explained. Uh, and so uh, is there anything, one thing, one thing they say is because they have to compute the, the Hessian matrix or the, the Hessian for um, updating their parameters theta, one thing you can do is use a first order approximation which is like, I think a Taylor expansion or something like that of, of the, the function you're trying to approximate um, instead. And then you don't have to compute the Hessian exactly, which makes it more computationally feasible. Um, anyway, uh, so in section three, they just go through what this general algorithm looks like for different uh, problems. And so they look at supervised regression and classification together because they're essentially the same. The, the reason why they're the same is if we go back to our formalization of a task, they are defined by having H equals one and no transition distribution. Um, so they're, they're, same, they're the same with respect to the formalization of a task. Um, and uh, one thing that they, they point out here, which is why I highlighted in green is that, um, you're assuming that it says, likewise in few shot regression, the goal is to predict the outputs of continuous valued functions from only a few data points sampled from that function after training on many functions with similar statistical properties. So uh, for regression, like one of, one of the key ideas of this method is that this is one way of saying that there's a sh shared statistical relationships or similarities between tasks in your task space. Like, if you were training models, if you were training a meta learning on data from like computer vision, and then you wanted to use your model to do regression on audio files, it would probably perform really poorly because they're not the same in terms of the, 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 like the structure of the task. Maybe they are, I don't know. Um, but that's a key idea. And to me, I, I was wondering when I read that, it's like, I wonder, I'm sure there are some methods, but I wonder what kind of methods there are available for like measuring the statistical similarities between tasks, because that would probably be really useful for determining 
when you could apply meta learning. Um, so then they talk about uh, reinforcement learning and how it can how this uh, mammal can be applied to reinforcement learning. Oh, there's the chat question. Uh, I can, I have a, uh, I'm just going to read it out. I have a question. The second jump is the second since it's performing is performing like ensembles as an averaging all hypotheses of the models. Thanks. Okay. Um, so the second jump, I'm assuming by the second jump, you're talking about, uh, where is it? Let's go up one. This update, update on, on line eight. And so uh, the, 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 um, the reason it is more, it's, it's actually key to the method because the idea is that you um, perform one gradient up the, the inner, the inner loop, which is from two to seven. This is like the inner loop of the algorithm. Oh no, sorry, from four to four to seven. That's the inner loop of the algorithm. You're basically practicing what you want to do at test time. What you're doing is you, you get a new task, you do one gradient update and you want good performance. And so what you're doing is then the second step at step eight, what you're saying is like, okay, I've gotten my performance by performing this single gradient update um, in the inner loop. And I want averaged across all tasks to get the best performance possible from that one gradient update. And so I'm gonna update my, 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 um, my parameters with respect to that objective. Um, so the, the, the gradient operator probably would be clear to have it inside the sum, right? Because, because yeah, because, because they technically evaluate each gradient separately and then they just sum over it rather than doing another differentiation of the sum of, of losses. Well, they do two differentiations. So the, the, what, what they could expand out this part of line eight to include this update in it. So you could tell that it was um, a new function. Because uh, mm -hmm. see, see here, they're using- How, how did they, uh, because, because they have the twice the, the gradient in there, right? Because in, in step five, six, they, they said we evaluate the gradient mm -hmm. with gradient descent. So, is, is the, 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 the line six gradient, is it the same as the gradient in uh, at the end of line six? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the, you, you don't need, so, so one, once you have that, you don't need it any, uh, so, so you, you don't really care about the update in uh, theta prime, right? Because you, you essentially you don't care about it. You only really care about the, the the size of the, the change of gradient if uh, it's, yeah of the uh, loss. You do care about theta prime because after you um, get theta prime, you evaluate it on the test set of the task, and so you need theta prime to see the performance after that update. And once you get the performance after that update, you update. Your your parameters with respect to that, but but isn't that sort of imp uh, implicit in the, in the in the gradient, right? Because the gradient essentially is loss before, loss after, and 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 how much the loss has changed, except that it's back propagated and and therefore. But so the loss you only have uh, like they're assuming your training set has a small set of examples from the tasks mm -hmm. from the task, so the gradient that you update with is a noisy gradient. It doesn't mean that when oh. you reevaluate because you're reevaluating on a different set of data points hmm. uh, you're evaluating on what they call the test set so um let me see actually it's probably clear over here um, uh so so the so is, is uh line eight was that over the test set yeah um so okay um, so, so there's a different de definitely a different gradient calculation again it's it's not you, you don't reuse the gradient from from number seven will you reuse it in the sense that you have your your you got the parameters of you got theta prime by performing gradient and a gradient update so mm -hmm. you have to take you have to take a gradient with respect to this um operation as well which is the one i'm highlighting over here you yeah have you have to take a gradient with respect to that um but wait i saw that um someone raised their hand uh, does anyone did 
Does anyone have any questions they want to ask? Or I saw that someone raised their hand. I'm gonna. So, so this, when, when we sum over the, 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 the task as, as distributed by P of T, that the, the summation is, is, is over test. No, 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 no it can't be, right? Ta is yeah. this task and not, not test. Uh, so uh, I'll just, I'm gonna go through uh, algorithm two because it's, it's for, it's for uh, regression and classification, but it makes it more obvious. Yeah. So um, you sample uh, a batch of tasks from your task space, TI. So you have like eight tasks. Then you sample K points, which is your training set. You evaluate the gradient on those K points, and then you update your parameters. Mm -hmm. And then you sample again from your task to get a test set, D prime. And then over here, what you do is you evaluate your loss function on your new function theta with the parameters theta prime on D prime, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Um, then, then update theta again, which, but theta is the parameter of your meta. Yeah, they're, they're, they're updating on theta and that's why they need to take a gradient with respect to this inner operation because they want to find the gradient with respect to this. Yeah. So, so the, the two gradient operation, the, the inner one is, is with respect to the, the parameters of the model. The outer one is with, with respect to the parameters of the meta algorithm, which is confusing because they have the same letter. Yeah, yeah. But no, it's the same because it's the same parameters. Are they? Yeah. So here, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, I guess, yeah. They're the same parameters. and. Like um, you have to take a gradient with respect to this part of the gradient yeah. update is one, but with this one, this is why you have to take the gradient with respect to theta of the gradient of theta. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, th I think it makes sense. Yeah, and that's why it you have to calculate the second derivative. Yeah, my answer, I think. Um, I, let me see. I'm just going to read this out. I think it might be that they are trying to preserve second order gradients. Preserve because regardless of the task you run, the second order gradient will remain the same. Maybe that is avoiding catastrophic forgetting, I think. I think that the second order gradients won't remain the same between tasks um, because for different tasks, you'll get a different, you, have, you might even have a different loss function. So you'll have different uh, gradients. Um, but I think that actually for me, the way that they're, uh, they're, preserve, they're stopping catastrophic forgetting is by uh, only performing a single gradient step update with respect to each task. Um, because then you can you can only go so far from the from your initial parameters. Uh, do do you really compute this second order or is it implicitly updated? Um, you, you, you they actually compute the second order gradient. Um, and they and or they use a first order approximation, but they use TensorFlow, which uh, where they have the ability to compute the second order gradient. It's it's computationally expensive. It's quite computationally expensive, but they do it in their training. Um, yeah, because essentially because it's the, the 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 gradient operator applied twice once once you substitute in the the results, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so. The, and then they talk about reinforcement learning. Uh, it's essentially the same, except you have a longer horizon and you have a transition distribution. Um, I'm just not, I'm not gonna go over it unless anyone has any questions, just because I think that uh, the idea is well explained with supervised uh, regression and classification. And I think we open a can of worms when we try to explain how it works in reinforcement learning, but I'm happy to answer any questions because I do have a background in reinforcement learning. Um, kind of like I've done research in it, but I wouldn't like I've never published. Actually, anyway, um, yeah, I would, I would, uh, yeah. If you want, I, if you have any questions, happy to answer them. Um, okay, so then they go into the related work. How much time? Do we have time? Then they go into the related work, and they talk about like the differences between their method and previous methods. One of them is that a lot of other methods for um, 
for learning to learn. So meta learning, it, they learned how to update the function instead of having an automatic way of doing it, which is what they, which is um, in this paper, they use gradients to, to do it. So they're learning how to, they're basically learning parameters that give good gradients, which I think is a really interesting idea. And actually, if you look at some more of Chelsea Finn's work, she reuses this idea in quite a few of her papers um, of using grit, like learning to get good gradients. Um, and then consequently, because you're, you're using gradients instead of a learned update, you have no additional parameters in this method. Um, they, they point out that the other, the other way of, uh, of, uh, of performing meta-learning, which is commonly used, is what we call transfer learning, which is where you have this massive data set of previous data, and you just train on it all together as if it's one single data set, which is not what's done here. Um, okay, and so then we'll go on to uh, experiments. And uh, one thing I like that they do in this paper, and I, I because I think it makes it very clear when you, what you're trying to accomplish is they point out what's the point of their experiments. So they say, the first one is, can MAML enable fast learning of new tasks? Can MAML be used for meta-learning in different domains? So for different problem settings. And three, can a uh, model learned with MAML continue to improve with additional gradient updates and or examples? So um, the point being that maybe you reach a local minimum using MAML. Uh, you're, you're near a lot of local minimums with your parameters that you learn from meta-learning like theta. And you perform one gradient update and you see an update, you see a improvement in performance, but then when you perform the second one, you don't. And that means that like, you may have learned how to optimize one good, uh, for one good gradient step, but maybe you're not actually learned a good initialization for your meta-learning task. Um, and so there, uh, the, for regression, they, they, for the, so the, their first experiments are on regression and they uh, have a really simple task, which is their function is a sine, or their task space is regression of a sine wave and you, you can modify the um, amplitude and phase of the sine wave. And um, so what they do is they sample like the, a number of tasks, so from a, a number of different functions and they, um, try their method for k equals 5, 10, 20, which means that each data set from each task has 5, 10, or 20 um, training points. Uh, so so uh, the, 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 the network knows about what a sign is? So, so, so it, it, it sees the, the, the phase and amplitude as an as a, as a input parameter or, or yeah? No, it doesn't. It just it just okay. gets x, which is like yeah, it just gets x, like the x-axis, and it's trying to predict y. Okay, so so it, it has not built in a <laughs> sine function in the TensorFlow at any point in time. But okay. No, it's never seen it. Cool. Um, and they compare it to two baselines, which is um, pre-training on all tasks. So they just give all the data at once without any uh, difference between them. And then um, where's the other one? Uh, and then an oracle, which is like the actual function. And so if you look at the results over here, you can, you can see the, the results for the sinusoidal regression. So you can see that the pre-trained model, um, it always, uh, it kind of like, it gets a certain level of performance and can't improve upon that. Whereas with MAML, you see, first off, you get that really great improvement in performance after one step. And then you continue to get some improvements after multiple gradient steps. And also the performance is relatively near the Oracle. And you can see that up here, which is um, this faint green line is the, the initialization of the, it's the answer with the, the initialized weights from meta learning. And then once they perform one gradient update, you can see what the, the function looks like. For... Isn't that a bit, a bit strange if, if the, it, it just means that the data set can't be uh, well distributed, right? So, so clearly if, if you already start with a higher amplitude at a particular value, it means that you 
data set must be biased towards example tasks that have a maximum there. Because, because usually if, if you were to take a prior over the, the variables of a sign, I don't know what, what kind of distribution you would get, but it, it must look pretty, pretty flat. Oh, um, so they, 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 they do have a bias. So they, they only sample with amplitudes between 0 0.1 and 5 and with phases between 0 and pi. Okay, so yeah, so, so so who knows? This could be like the mean of those parameters. <laughs> that is their weight initialization. So between zero and pi means it's yeah. So, so it essentially means that the the uh, what does it mean actually? The the, the knots can only move so far mean, back and forth, right? It yeah. It means that you could either start like at zero. You could think of your yeah. sine wave starting at zero and going up, and then at pi, I think it would be, uh, it would be going down. Yeah, but that is, isn't that the, the complete range? Because it's, it's uh, uh, because it can't go negative, right? So so because because the, the, the full phase space is two pi. So uh, yeah, you could you you'll never get past that point. Um, <clears throat> and so. Uh, You'll you'll never you'll never get like uh, starting below zero exactly. You yeah. might yeah. yeah. Um, and they one thing that they they say is that for this method of regression, and I actually think this is a really simple task and possibly too simple to really evaluate the performance of this model, but um, the thing it does do is it does demonstrate the behavior that they're talking about. So it does answer the questions of their experiments. And from that point of view, um, it's a good proof of concept. So it's a bit simple to say like, I guess when I say, I think it's a bit simple, it's a bit simple to see whether this method works on real world tasks, but it's good enough to prove that this method is working the way that they are claiming it will. Um, and two points they make from regression, from the regression experiments is that Mammal can still infer the amplitude and phase in the other half of the range, which means that even if they show only half of the range of tasks that they, they talked about and then sample from the other half, that they get the right um, the right answer. Oh no, sorry, that, that, so if they, even if they only sample like from zero to minus five, because their, their range is from minus five to 10 to five, um, that the, the, the function that's learned can extrapolate to the other edge. And so that, I mean, I'm not describing it correctly, but basically one of the things I was wondering is like, can mammal functions extrapolate? So uh, learn functions that generalize outside of the support of their training set. And in this very simple example, they can. So but that seems pretty weird, right? Because if, if they don't have an inherent understanding of what a, what a sign is, on what, what grounds would they, would, they, would they even make that assumption that it, it goes on like this? Well, they 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 learn from minus five to five, so they're only learning within a very small range. Yeah. Um, on what grounds would they make this assumption? Um, because if, if you, of course, if you, if you parameterize your model to to learn uh, the, the parameters of a sign, right? You you can do that. Then then of course this sort of extrapolation is is trivial. But then of course you you have told the model that you're expecting signs, and I don't know. But because, because why shouldn't the model just put in a flat line over there or, or a negative value? I, I don't know. I guess these functions are more expressive than we think or something like that. Yeah. I know that uh, MLPs, like the, the, the networks that were used for the regression task, they are essentially like piecewise linear functions. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe you can just get really good uh, piecewise linear approximations of the time. <laughs> it's, it sort of does, does like a Fourier transform of, of your data or something like that, potentially. Because yeah. we, we, I do remember we had to talk about kernels. How can you get your most expressive kernels? And the most expressive kernel has some sort of amplitude and some sinoid uh, components that, that allows you, and then probably would get something like that. So maybe it has learned. Maybe it has a, a learned a very effective class of, of, of kernels that are very expressive. Mm. Maybe. And uh, the other thing that they point out from the um, uh, from the from the regression task is that 
MAML continues to improve with additional gradient steps despite being trained for maximal performance after one gradient step. So they're pointing out that it also has that third, it also answers that third question. Mahad, uh, do you have something you wanted to say or um, write on the chat? Okay. Um, in the meantime, I'll just talk about the, I'll, I'll, I'll answer your question as soon as you, you put, type it, but in the meantime, I'll talk about the classification. Oh. Uh, the changes in the, in what do you mean by the changes in the input? How fast it changes, graph changes. Um, the second order, uh, no, in, the, in this case, the second order uh, gradients um, what they're learning is uh, I, I think he has a good point actually. So 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 the because the um, period of all the, the sinoids are just the same in in all the tasks, right? So 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 it, it sort of got the new task of, of learning what is the period of the sine waves you you are supposed to predict. Not sure, and, and that's so. So, so the, the, the learning of a task could, in principle, be, be perhaps uh, uh, phrased as, as as a learning of a different task based on the full data set that, that is given, rather than only the, the single shots. And that yeah. potentially would then also explain why extrapolation might work, but uh, still, still a bit weird. And can you unmute my In the meantime, I'll just um, talk about the classification task. Um, oh, okay. Hi, Peter, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, oh Peter and Arvid, uh, that's a very good discussion. I, I think it's, um, um, it's, it's still not uh, sort of solidifying in my thoughts. What I think is that um, the second order gradient, like if, if you think the first order gradient just tells you how sharp a, a curve is, while the second order will tell you which direction is it, is it a positive or negative. So what, what happens in continual learning? The problem is, is that you, you get good at a task, you perform a number of gradient descents on let's say T1, and then you switch to another task, and then all of a sudden your um, loss explodes, and you're you're not uh, descending anymore, or perhaps you're going in a different direction to where the uh, minimum is. So, because it's like a domain shift problem, I think second order gradients uh, might preserve the uh, how how would you say how the direction of the descent it's throughout the activity. task. Sorry, it, it, it's sort of you, you optimizing the sensitivity. How you you optimize how sensitive the output is to peculiarities, and and so so if you, if you think of uh, I only know it in physics, right? But there, there there is such a thing in physics where you can say that second order information about how a system fluctuates tells you how sensitive that 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 thing is to 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 changes, and I, I think something bit similar happens here as well. Um. Yeah, and I think they should have been, it might be that this should have been clear in the hypothesis that maybe this information is enough to give a, uh, a global perspective of all the tasks. So you don't, you don't, you don't uh, catastrophically forget what the, what the, what the entire input. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that there might be a, 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 a way of learning the local information, if you think of the per task as a local information, and a global information that, that covers all the tasks. So it's a bit like a, a, a model that has an ensemble teacher. But not, not that the teacher is, uh, as if, uh, because teacher is used in these uh, papers as in a pre-trained network, but I, I misused the terms there. But is that what it's happening um, in, all, in this uh, paper? Um, 
to be honest, I actually thought that the re the way that they were dealing with catastrophic forgetting is by uh, summing the losses over all of the tasks in their training set at once. But don't they sample uh, tasks uh, in, in line three? Yeah, yeah, but they're, they're sampling over a number of tasks. So their gradient update is with respect to like a, a, a sub a batch of tasks from their task space. Hmm. And consequent, like, because at least Mahad, what I understood is when you're talking about continual learning, you're saying you update your function on the newest task, and then you update your function on the next task. Like every time you get a new task, you update your function. But here, they're updating their function based on a batch of tasks all at once. Once, and so I thought that's how they were dealing with the issue of catastrophic forgetting. But maybe not. Um, I, I would agree. Right. Is it um, like the, the? Is it like a how? I think th there's some papers that uh, sort of have these these memory hubs, where s uh, some of the most representative inputs of each task will be stored in a separate uh, hub. Like like if you're using LSTM, there'll be a separate gate for it. Um, I think in this case, they it, it doesn't say how do they sample. Do they have some form of a heuristic that tells them, okay, maybe this input from this task is useful, maybe that input, or maybe it's all random. Um, but yeah, yeah I, I see where you're getting at. I, I, I agree that it might just be that this, this whole uh, idea of averaging losses across all tasks is preserving the uh, in, information, um, the vital information that, that, that does helps you not forget uh, to have catastrophic for game. And yeah, I agree with that. Also, I would almost suspect that the, the, these algorithms learn some something about the input space as well, right? Because <clears throat> even though each task might have only very few shots, right, over many many tasks, the the model sees essentially a, a very of space of the of the in, in which all the task inputs lie, right, and, and that might already um be, be, be mean that the, the model sees and, and has as a chance of of um sh you know maybe find some f form of representation of, of set space yeah and i think it's a good point that i didn't actually maybe i'll say either understand or think of which is that the second order gradient is important to learning sensitive weights for your model so that's cool yeah. um so in this case, it's almost like a, like a gradient square. What they're actually doing, right? When they, when they do the first order approximation, it's essentially they're, they're they're optimizing the square of the gradients, which it does which exactly would then be sensitivity, almost like like how, yeah. Hmm. And uh, to answer your question about how they sample, in the experiments, they assume a uniform distribution over tasks in every situation. Um, so uh, at least in experiments, they're assuming a uniform distribution, which again uh, makes, um, well, no, yeah, that, that's fine. I don't, I don't think they need to, I, I think the method is built in robust to different distributions of tasks because you're sampling from them. But um, anyway, so I'll just go over the last results really quickly so that we can have some time to ask more questions. They, in the classification experiments, they uh, look at two few shot learning classification tasks because unlike regression, there's actually some like benchmarked tasks here. Um, and they, they do do some data augmentation on the Omniglot data set, which is a data set where you classify uh, characters um, from different alphabets. Uh, so I was thinking like, I guess they, ha they have to do that, but it also uh, could be a reason for good uh, generalization. Like the data augmentation could be the reason for good generalization. So it muddies the waters a bit, but basically their method outperforms the other methods um, by, it, with, with the Omniglot test uh, data set, not enough to be like statistically significant, uh, but with the, um, with the uh, mini image net data set, in both cases, it's definitely statistically significant, but it's definitely on par and slightly better in the Omniglot data set. So 
Um, yeah, I was, I was gonna, I'll go back to this comment if we have time, because I was thinking, oh, this is an interesting comment that we could discuss. And then they do a reinforcement learning tasks and they do two reinforcement learning tasks. One is your point mass and you're trying to go to a specific location. And one is your a uh, like it's a locomotion task where you're either a cheetah or a crab and you're trying to move at a certain rate. In both situations, they uh, <coughs> outperform their baseline, which is I think just the method pre-train or this yeah they pre-train one policy on all tasks and then perform fine tuning. And then they have an oracle, which is a, ta a policy that knows the, um, the correct goal. Um, yeah, and they just show that uh, the, that mammal is able to produce the best results and learn really quickly, as opposed to the other methods, which actually maintain a low performance. So they don't, they don't generalize well um, over with a few training steps. Um, and uh, one of the other baselines that they, they have is just uh, random initialization. And they say, the results also show that on challenging tasks, minimal initialization substantially outperforms random initialization in pre-training. So um, it's good to know. Uh, so yeah, I, I, sorry I went through those results really quickly. If you have any uh, questions about them, feel free to ask. If not, I just wanted to open the, the floor for questions um, before we finish. Go ahead, Mahan. Oh, um, uh, okay, uh, so in the meantime, I just wanted to read out this comment. So they, they do a, a first order approximation of the Hessian or the second derivative, and they, um, and they evaluate its performance on over here. And you can see that actually the performance with the first order approximation of the Hessian is a pretty close to the performance of the just mammal in general. And so they point out that the fact that this first order approximation is good is, um, I, I'm just gonna finish this and I'll go to the question. It's, it says, suggesting that most of the improvement in MAMO comes from the gradients of the objective at the post update parameter values rather than the second order updates from differentiating through the gradient update. So, cause the first order approximation of the Hessian is gonna be around the new parameter values. So that's just an interesting point. Um, Agatha says, I was just wondering if anyone knows any of the data sets they used and could give an example of different tasks they trained the models on. Oh yeah, so um, I'll give you an example from the, the data set. That, uh, 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 for the classification tasks, <coughs> Omniglot is one of the data sets and uh, it says it here. Omniglot contains, consists of 20 instances of 16, 623 characters from 50 different alphabets. Um, so you have 20 data set points for 1,623 characters from 50 different alphabets. And then uh, mini image net involves 64 training classes, 12 validation classes, and 24 test classes. So um, both of them are examples where you have uh, very few examples of uh, each class. Um, in, in the case of uh, mini image net, I think you only have one or five images. Um, and then for Reinforcement learning, they use just uh, you are in a 2D space and the task is to get to a goal position and you're given different goal positions, which the agent is unaware of, but they have a reinforcement, they have a reward function that they can learn it from. Um, so you can imagine that you might have one goal here and then another task would have one goal here and you're trying to teach your agent through reward that he needs to go to that point. And I hope that was helpful. I was wondering, so, so, so implicitly what they have done is optimize the, the, the network for sensitivity or like how quickly can update. Do you have any idea what other metrics 
one could use as a, as a meta loss that, that, that might be interesting? Uh, two things. I think they it's sensitivity, but also uh, like they're trying to come to a local minimum that has sensitivity and can lead to good performance. I don't, I don't know if there's any other one, but like I could imagine in such a complex optimization space that maybe there's local minima that are highly sensitive, but they don't, they're, they're so, they perform so poorly initially that the gradient update won't lead anywhere good. Maybe I could think of maybe something like, like a regret loss. So say, say that uh, I want to minimize regret, which, which might not find the, the best uh, minimum, but, but maybe the finds minima that are, are least likely to be catastrophically bad for me. So, so that, that might, might be something that is a slightly different formulation, but might lead to different results, but that potentially could also be useful in practice. Yeah, I think you could think of any uh, reinforcement learning objective that's more vogue right now, like safety aware. Yeah, or, yeah for example, yeah. Yeah. Or what are some other ones? Um, safety aware is the one that comes up a lot. I'll just give that example and say I can't think of it. <laughs> Minimizing damage to the car. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cool. Oh, great paper. Very interesting. Yeah, it's a. I I think it's well written. Um, it's a very interesting idea. Good experiments. Highly cited. So it's a good paper. Yeah. Very. I've enjoyed that a lot. Thank you so much. I'm gonna stop sharing. Stop recording.